get to spend some time with folks who are developing golfers around the world because in truth you know whatever i do and and, and kind of what our families achieved through golf. I'm Trevor's brother, let's be honest. <laughs> but you know, golf has blessed us in a big way. And, and so I'm thankful to you guys. And I'm thankful for the chance to, to be around you for a little while. No, well, we appreciate having you in. And as you know, everybody that's listening today is a golf instructor, either they're at academies of ours, they specialize in certain areas. We've got a lot of and um, people that specialize in the junior world of instruction. I know we've just briefly, before we came live, talked about that. And um, we can maybe touch on that subject a little bit later. Um, and some friends of our instructors around the world. So if anybody's joining us that is not a Ledbetter certified instructor at the moment, uh, welcome to the family today. Uh, we do this every week and we, we try to want to make sure that all instructors have the chance to to keep bouncing questions and work as a network. Um, I think it's really important that people have that opportunity to feel free to ask questions and learn from each other. And I certainly learn a massive amount from everybody every week. Uh, Mark, talking about learning, um, you have a, an amazingly fantastic podcast. I've been, had the pleasure to be part of it uh, recently. You've done over 490 episodes. You've interviewed and spoke with some of the most revered golf players, golf pundits, golf instructors, um, and all of the warps of life around the world. We can't wait to pick your brains today about your <laughs> learnings from that. You're also an author, a Scandalously Simple is your book, uh, and a coach. You're a full-time coach with Columbus State University. Um, so there's so many areas and directions that we could go in in the conversation today. But I would love for you to take a little bit of a trip to start with back down memory lane maybe just tell us how it all started and how you fell in love with the game that we've all fallen in love with. You know what, Stuart, it's, it's so much serendipity was involved. You know, I was a young South African kid um, way back in the day. Now I'm 50 years young now. And, and you know, looking back, uh, you know, we played all sports, you know, it's an outdoor nation where we are and, and you'd play rugby in the winter as a guy and you'd play cricket and tennis and, and whatever else in, in the summertime. And, and I'm sort of of the era of, you know, Ernie L. Stratifkos and that sort of age. And mm. so when we were coming up, golf wasn't that big a deal. You know, I, I was much more wanting to be a, a cricketer or a rugby player. And, and then I had a pretty grisly uh, wrist injury in rugby. I'm a small guy, was always small and, and broke my left wrist badly. And, um, Honestly, my, my rugby coach went to my parents and said, look, he's good, but this kid's not good enough to play rugby from here on. And this was at 13. And so I was in a cast for a, a few months, really. And when I came back, my buddy said, hey, uh, we're going to play golf. It was a Saturday morning. And um, do you want to join us? And I was like, sure. So I went to my dad and I'm left handed, naturally. And um, he said, well, my clubs are in the garage. They're old and dusty. Bobby Locks, I'll never forget forget them. They were right-handed. And I went to the golf course and fumbled my way around there. And, and the rest is history. You know, the, the proverbial bug bit quickly. I was at a, a club back then that sort of promoted junior golf. And um, more power to them because there were some good golfers that came out of that club. In fact, Justin Harding, who plays in the European tours from there, my brother, obviously, and a few other guys who played professionally around the world. So got into golf and, and it just all sort of flowed from there. I luckily got good pretty quick. And then there were just a lot of good people along the way that sort of guided my, my path and opened doors for me and uh, went to the army back in the day. It used to be mandatory in South Africa, played on a defense force team alongside Ernie and Goose and a bunch of hall of famers now. And then there was a little old me and uh, I got to college and it sort of all progressed from there. Um, got to college on a bit of a whim also because I was caddying at the time. And so I've sort of done it all. But looking back now, um, I count myself fortunate to have had all the experiences that I did because they've sort of uniquely qualified me, I think, to, to have a different sort of a voice in the game. And um, look, to be honest with you, golf is the reason why I sit here with you. Um, golf is the reason why whatever I've managed to achieve through my life is, is, is a function thereof and the folks I've gotten to meet. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hugely fortunate. Um, and, and I don't take the responsibility of being a golf teacher lightly mm -hmm. because I think for too long I've seen, because I was of the era of instructor that sort of came up 
in the mid 90s. And we were armed with our Sony Handycam and our uh, V1 system. And we were co comparing everyone to Tiger and Ernie at the time. And, and as I look back, um, <laughs> I gave some pretty bad lessons, to be honest with you. And, uh, and so I'm, it's occurred to me here in later years that our responsibility is, is custodians of the industry and folks who guiding golfers to not just better golf, but more enjoyment of the game. It's a big deal. And so, so I don't take, take this, I don't take this lightly at all. And I'm thankful to be where I am. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. And I, I think we're all thankful to golf to be sat here today. You know, we, 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 golf's been good to all of us, but I think on the flip side of it, we've all been good to golf as well. You know, I think the majority of the people on here would agree. We all care immensely about trying to help the game develop for the future. And we're always learning. Uh, you talk about giving some poor lessons back in the day. Um, I remember starting out my journey back in 99 in Austria at a resort that was immensely busy and thinking I kind of knew a little bit about teaching. I'd just done my PGA stuff, just started out with Ledbetter. And I look back now and go, geez, I, I wish I could turn back the clock. But I think that's testament to how much we feel as though we've progressed as well. Well, this is, where I, this is where I appreciate what you guys are doing and I appreciate everyone on board here because it's sort of occurred to me here of late that you have TrackMan or have FlatScope and you hang out your teaching shingle if you've played some golf during your life and the next thing you're reading back data to people in the interests of helping them to improve where I love what you guys are doing where you're building a complete understanding of not just the method and the principles and the elements of golf instruction and better golf, but you're developing human beings and you're developing understanding and, and you, you, there's conceptual stuff that's on the go because there's so much more to good golf than, 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 than better numbers on a launch monitor. And as a college coach, I see that front and center of a bunch. Yeah, I think touching upon that, obviously you're at Columbus State, uh, kind of return home. You, you went to college there um, as a young guy. Um, being a college coach is maybe not what a lot of people think a college coach is. And it'd be great to dive into your world of coaching, not only just the college golf, but the individual lessons or the corporate stuff that you do as well. And, and talk a little bit about what your coaching philosophy is, what your values are, what environment you try and create. It'd be great for you to bring to life kind of what you live by on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure all the coaches listening would love to hear a little bit of, of you. Yeah, as an instructor um, and as a podcaster too, I'm, I'm guided by a, a mission, which is to cultivate ability and talent. Uh, and, and I picked the word cultivate because like I said, I've realized now with the benefit of some years in, in the industry that you can't necessarily change something. You know, if there's an apple tree seed in the ground, you can't try and turn that into an orange tree. And as a young teacher, I think I try to do that once in a while. So, so I'm always just, you know, going into every lesson with the mindset of I'm going to cultivate this individual's ability and I'm going to help him get the most out of his him or her get the most out of their talents and then and their skill, obviously, too. So that's kind of my guide. And then somewhere in the back of my head, uh, there's this voice that is screaming at me constantly and this is and this is honestly something i learned from butch Harmon way back in the day and and that's you know he said it a bit more colorfully than i will on this uh, on this get together but it was not to screw up talent and not to screw up the athletes and so in the back of my head i'm like we cultivating here and, and the mission whether this player is elite or whether this player is a beginner golfer is to not to screw up what they do well. Mm -hmm. And because for so long, and still I think uh, a lot of golfers, and I put myself in that bushel where, you know, we see a video or you do an analysis or whatever the case might be, and all of a sudden you just hit the dilemma and, and hopefully you're hitting the cause for the problem and not just the symptom. So you get so singular in that, that sometimes we disregard the entire individual and the entire circumstance and so much of golf to me is situational you know you can work with a player on the range until the cows come home if he gets he or she gets into the into the wind off the left and that's uncomfortable on the 16th hole of the final round of a tournament you know that's when skill is brought to bear that's when the individual and the talent is brought to bear and if you've coached the 
the athlete out of the golfer, uh, you're going to have a tough time under pressure. So, so that's sort of guiding me. Um, and then uh, as a coach, as an instructor, I'm, I'm very holistic. If you've ever listened to the podcast, I'm, I, I believe that the good golf happens at the intersection of you know, good physicality, good mental approach, good emotional approach, and to a large extent, a good spiritual approach. And where those elements mesh, I think is where the sweet spot is. And so I'm always trying to make sure that you look at the physical and then you look at the mental and you look at the emotional, which is on the golf course kind of situational, if you will. And you start to understand what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses? Don't, in the interest of improving the strengths or improving the weaknesses, I should say, disregard the strengths. Because when it, the individual gets down to their base level under pressure, their strengths is what they're going to go to. Mm -hmm. You know, in any sport, like if I'm the soccer coach or if I'm the basketball coach or whatever, if there's 15 seconds on the clock and we got to score, the ball is going to the best player with respect to everyone else because that's what it's about. So, so, so I'm, I'm big on this holistic approach and understanding what the individual is likely to do um, when the pressure gets up and everything gets exposed. So, so, so that's a large part of what I do too. And, and, and those three ideas kind of guide, I would say, the, my decision-making. You know, every, everything's very holistic. Everything's very current, but forward thinking. You know, as all of you guys are being the lead better folks, you know, you look for the cause and then you deal with the cause and you deal with the effects that, that, that transpire after that. And, but always, as I say, remembering that individual is created uniquely. Mm -hmm. uh, that individual is created perfectly. And, and it's our job to cultivate and hone skill and, and talent, not to get, get in the business of getting in there with a sharp axe and, and, and starting to try and reshape too much. No, I think you put that perfectly. And a little bit of kind of how Gavin and I deal with our certification process. Obviously, our job is to help educate or add value to what the coaches already have when they come to us and see if we can help them just like a player get better in their craft. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, we've started now this year, we've actually implemented, we do a, a personality profile at the start and we work with a company in the UK that, that come from a performance sport background. So performance cricket, they work with a number of premiership football clubs here, so soccer clubs um, and English rugby, uh, the British Athletics Association now. And I think what Gavin and I really feel strongly about and for us as a company we really want to get to know the individual. So as you would deal with a player as an individual and you really want to understand the player and what makes them tick, what drives them, what motivates them, what helps them with their energy, how do they source their confidence, you know, what things tick them off quickly, how do I communicate best with them, how do I get the best out of them? And this profile for us really helps kind of help that self-reflection for a coach and helps us help get the best out of them in their certification process. But I think it hopefully gives them a different perspective of how they then deal with a player. Uh, and I think you work with, obviously, at college, a lot of young players. Um, and I know Gavin's keen to kind of ask you a couple of things around that college journey. So I'll let Gavin jump in. But I think what you just said there is massive. And whether that's educating coaches or trying to educate the students to be the best they can be. And I think for us, it's mm -hmm. always about how do you create the best environment? How do you create the correct opportunities? And how do you then hopefully unlock the potential of that player? And like you say, they're individual. Well, if I may, before Gavin jumps in here, um, I, this came to me on a whim, like way back. I mean, this was when I was a young teacher and maybe I just thought it was cool sounding back then, but now I honestly buy in. And and I've, I say to each and every lesson, still to this day, whether they're a PGA Tour winner or a, a beginner, I'm like, if I've done my job as a teacher properly, I'm going to put myself out of business as a teacher mm -hmm. because then I've empowered you to understanding. You know, knowledge is one thing, but the understanding and the application of that appropriately is entirely another. So that's the teacher's job in me. And then from there, I'm more from a teacher to a sounding board slash coach. You know, someone where the communicate somewhere where the communication is less like this sort of thing, teacher to student, and it starts to become almost more student to teacher. 
I, I heard it said beautifully on my, on my podcast, um, Rick Sessinghouse, who's a longtime professional out in California. He's guided a number of good players to success, most notably of late Colin Marikawa. And I had Colin on and I spoke to him and, and Rick's whole thing about with Colin always is self-discovery. He would highlight a principle, describe its benefits, uh, illustrate the pitfalls, sort of show where the roadmap would be en route to where you're going and why, and then just leave it up to Colin to figure it out. And then Colin would come back with ownership and probably some more insightful ideas as to how to implement this thing, not just on the range, but under pressure as well. So, so when I listen to that, I'm like, you know, that's kind of how I try and communicate. I'm trying to put myself out of business as a, as a teacher mm -hmm. and put myself into the situation where I'm listening to your feedback because in the final analysis, just like you guys know, they're all the people with the hands on the rubber end of the golf club. You know, when the, when, when the stuff starts hitting the fan, we're on the sidelines and they're uh, in the arena and it's up to them to have ownership of what they do. Yeah, perfect. Gav, you want to fire away? Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, I think many people uh, tuning in today might not realize that um, being a college coach, you have something that's very unique and exclusive to the college world, which is the ability to coach in the moment during a tournament. And um, I always found that fascinating when, when I coached at college. You see my gray hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, with that being so exclusive, how, how do you take that opportunity to, um, to shape the result that you're obviously looking for in the short term, which is the tournament, but also with, uh, with that individual player for long-term development you know what i'm uh, i don't know if i'm a good one to ask for this i I've, I've won a few coaching awards and it's it's occurred to me that the coach of the year is the individual who had the best team and, and i've been the national coach of the year over here and, and because my team was really good in fact i said to that team i'm like you guys as far as i'm concerned are the five most talented golfers one can assemble and i'm going to prove a point to you and i essentially did nothing at every tournament for that entire year and i won the coach of the year <laughs> I showed up, I, I gave them snacks, I gave them Gatorade. When they needed a pat on the back, I gave them one. When they needed a pat a, pat a little lower down and just to wake them up, I, I did that. But, but that was sort of my approach. And, but to, to the coaching on the course, that's, that's a really good point you bring up because I'm really averse to that. And it gets back to the individual. Now, when I'm out on the course with a college player, no matter what their skill level is, I say to them, you call me over and I will give you my opinion. I'm not going to come and tell you what to do because then it's going to be uh, done. Uh, I nearly said half, uh, half fast, but I, I'm, forgive me for my language. So, so I, I want you completely involved. Yes. If you need my opinion, ask me, I will come and tell you what I think. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I will give you the pros. I'll give you the cons. I will maybe give you the 36,000 foot view of the situation where when you're a golfer, you're so singular that sometimes with the pressure and the angst and whatever's going on, the holistic approach, you might miss something. So I'm not the kind of college coach and there's a proliferation of them right now where you are telling this poor unsuspecting child what to do on every shot. And this kid is like, like a horse with a really tight rein in its mouth. And to get back to how I run my team, I'm like, if you guys come to my team, I believe you have the ability to play golf at the highest level. So you, essentially, you're the best of the best. You're like a thoroughbred. And I'm like, on my ranch, my farm, I'm going to give you a big, wide pen. And you can run wild in there. That's what you do, right? But if you start misbehaving, I'm just going to narrow the boundaries of the pen a little bit. You'll still be able to run, but under the parameters. So it's kind of like the jockey riding the racehorse. Most of the times that thing is on a light bit. Now they don't ever ride the horse hard because then it can't be a thoroughbred. And so when I'm on the golf course with an individual, 
look, if, if the proverbial stuff's hitting the fan, I'll go in there and insert myself and say, hey, just settle down a little bit. Let's get back to the process. Let's get back to the job at hand. Let's get back to what your key thoughts are. Let's get back to what brought you to this place because you have to qualify for my team. So you qualified so you were playing well. You haven't accidentally lost your game right now. So, so, so I don't know if I'm the best one to talk about because I let them go out there. And then afterwards, we address why and how. And before the time, there's a game plan that's set up. And if they have to deviate from that game plan, I respect them enough to do this. Now, if they're doing something dumb, I'm going to have to, I'll have something to say about it afterwards. But the sad truth is, it's kind of like me watching my two young girls learn to swim when they were littlies. They just got tossed into the water and they had to swim. And the teacher was always there in case dilemma happened. And I'm sort of always there. So, so I'm letting them express themselves under pressure. I'm letting them learn under pressure. I'm letting them have the exhilaration of performing to a high level under pressure, but I'm also allowing them the luxury of failing under the highest of pressure. Because some of those lessons that they're likely to learn, if they're open-minded enough, and that's where I get to them afterwards, I'm like, hey, what happened over there in as much as what this could be the end of your world right now? This is probably the best thing that could have ever happen to you. And if you start to change the mindset, then they see that, then it becomes a learning instance. Because the truth of it all is, I'm a firm believer because I've played at a high level as you guys all have. Um, some guy just blabbing away in the sideline when pressure's on me and I've got all this stuff going on, that's just more to have to contend with. Mm -hmm. and, and all those lessons they learn in that tournament situation, in that pressure situation, those are lessons for a lifetime and they are infinitely more valuable than what I'm ever gonna, what I'm ever gonna give them. Yeah, that is fascinating. I, I don't think you'd, you'd ever want to overpower the, the players. The, the one point I found that was really fascinating about the moment was almost saying to the player, look, this is a snapshot right now of, of kind of what we talk about when we're not in the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's almost trying to get them to remember this situation so that you can talk about it in more depth um, when you get back to the driving range or whatever. It's funny because I keep remembering Seve in the Ryder Cup in, in 1997 and he seemed to be coaching every single player running, driving around like a <laughs> madman, wasn't he? Um, didn't work out so well, did it? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, there's some yeah. funny stories, wasn't it? With, well, Monty's got a very funny story about it and where he just told uh, Seve to, to bugger off and leave him alone. But... Um, well, it, Gavin, uh, Gavin I've, I've got to say this so I don't appear all high and mighty because <laughs> <laughs> I live and die by every golf shot that any client of mine has yeah. ever hit. In fact, I've made it a goal to not idolize live scoring on the PGA Tour because when I was working with players full time, my marriage was suffering by me getting stuck to my phone, finding where the shot tracer of my client was going. And that's just not a healthy situation for anyone to be, including the player. And so I, I, I live and die by golf shots, I'll be honest with you. And I have a da two daughters, 13 and nine, and the 13-year-old is pretty good. And it is so hard for me to walk along and watch and just be removed from this thing and just sometimes watch the biggest disasters unfold in front of me because I want to swoop in and save the day. <laughs> and And... And so it's downright difficult. So I don't, don't let me for one minute tell each and every one of you, oh, I've got it all together. I don't, okay. <laughs> because I love golf and I know they love golf and I love each and every one of them. And I don't want them to go through it, but I'm okay enough with myself, I guess at 50 years young and okay enough with understanding the process and trusting the process to know that this can be dealt with after the round of golf. Yeah. And the truth is they're going to be, God willing, hundreds of more rounds of golf in the future. Let's just allow this to unfold. Let's let this event take care of itself. Let's let this event proliferate into whatever it's supposed to be. Let's let this event even perhaps be the disaster that gets salvaged. Because another book I'd written is Golf is a Game of Recovery. 
and you're never going to learn that unless you've been in trouble. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. and so yeah. and so it's it, it's 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 difficult to do. It's really hard to do, but it's something that I think as all of us we should strive toward. Mm -hmm. So. Um... Certainly my world is focused around five to 12 year olds and I'm, I've got a really kind of clear picture of the type of golfer that we want to produce for the next set of coaches that will take these teenagers on. But we've got a lot of um, folks watching now who teach the teenagers. Uh, what is it you look for at Columbus State in that 18 year old that will lead you to recruit them, offer them a scholarship and, and invite them to take the next part of their journey with you. <laughs> okay, this is the, here's a snapshot into who I am deep down, if you haven't figured me out already. If someone has written me a letter, don't be a form letter writer to me. Don't be the individual that cut, writes one letter and cut and paste coaches' names in there if you're wanting to come and play for us. I want to see your individuality. I want to see that you have desire enough to craft a letter to us. Not telling us how good you are, just telling us what your goals are, why you believe we can help you achieve those sorts of goals, because therein lies the thing. You see, the holistic approach to me, I'm, I'm more interested in the individual and their character than the talent because we can help you cultivate your talents. If you've got gifts and stuff, we will help you bring the most out of those things. But Because what people got to realize is this age, 18 to 20, whatever it is, two, when you're in college, those are still very formative years and a lot is learned. And when you come in and when you leave, you're going to be two vastly different people if we've done our job properly. So as soon as I see some form letter, you know, one that's been cut and pasted from somewhere they found online, I just, I switch off immediately, even if this indiv individual is a blue chip, because I've seen a number of blue chippers not make it because of just being intellectually switched off. Because at the highest of high levels, if you want to get there, they all have the physical gifts. They all do. Some of them a whisker more than others, like an outlier as a tiger or a Rory or a Dustin Johnson or th those sorts of things, right? But everyone at that level is infinitely talented. So what separates you up there, if to use a term, is that little bit that you do extra. That, that, that we, we, we've got a, um, an army lieutenant colonel that works with our team. He's been in war situations and stuff. And the whole mantra he shares with them all of the time is do one more. He goes, if someone's done 10 push-ups, you do 11. If the coach is asking you to do this, you do it just with a little bit better. He goes, get into the mindset of that sort of thing. So that's the first thing I look, I look for. Um, secondly, I'm looking for an individual that's comfortable with themselves. Now, I know that's hard to pick as an 18-year-old, mm -hmm. but when you get away, especially if you're an international and you're in a different place with a different culture, suddenly you're doing your own laundry, uh, you know, golf takes a backseat. You know, we've got a youngster on our team right now talented young man who is struggling not because of the golf stuff it's because of everything else so again it, it i've learned as a college coach since 2001 whenever i took this job that we're human beings who play golf so that's where i'm looking because i've had my hair blown back by golf as i watch them play i'm like lord almighty this is this is the second coming right and then they show up in college and it all turns into a disaster because they just can't deal with life and they don't have mom or dad or whoever it is to, to help them, to help save them. Now that is to certainly is the coach's job, but we're not there all of the time and, and there's growth time involved. So, so I look at the, the immeasurables first and then the measurables of watching some kids golf swing or watching them play or whatever. Yeah. You know, they, then they're in their comfort zone and get back to the golf as a game of recovery thing. I, I, I say to my daughter, I said, everyone I teach, every, any tournament golfer I teach, I'm more interested in how you score when you're playing, playing badly than how you score when you play well. Because when I get a resume from a kid, they've picked out all their good results and they've listed them there. <laughs> I'm like, I want to see you play when you can't hit the broad side of a barn. 
and I don't want to see you put a, a golf score up because that's going to happen. And uh, they sort of think I'm crazy, but that's the truth of the game. And, and now at the PGA Tour level, i got to tell you, it's the same deal up there. You know, there's one stage, I learned it from Nick Price, who's all you led better folks. He, he should be on our Mount Rushmore, okay? Um, Price, he said to me, he goes, I became a tournament winner when I learned to make my bad day good. And so it's just that, that mindset of doing a little extra, being prepared to grind more, dealing with the adversity of it all, all these other things, you know, the, the, the not, I call them the shadow side of the game. Deal with the shadow stuff well, and I'm interested in you. Everyone can do well in the sunlight. That's a great point. I think, Mark, talking about people, you know, you've got over 490 episodes on your podcast. You commentate um, regularly. Um, you, know, you try and balance college coaching and coaching. You've got a lot going on. But for over 490 episodes, you must have spent an enormous amount of time with some really talented individuals that have been high achievers um, and people mm -hmm. from all different areas, whether it's high achievers in golf or whether it's high achievers in other walks of life. Um, I would imagine your notebooks lying around the place of the notes that you scribble down when you're going through your interviews must be amazing to read. Uh, I would like to kind of dive a little bit deeper into from all of the time you've spent doing on the mark, what things do you feel as or what stands out to you that you've gained in your learnings from other people that have really helped you in your coaching? Um, I guess the first thing would be that they're just different approaches to success. Um, because when I was a young instructor coming up, like I said, I had a V1 system with some footage of Ernie Els on there and Tiger Woods video that I got from someone. And I was just a swing comparer. And I was pointing out um, I was comparing, I was, I was pointing out differences. And now, nowadays, you know, with all of these minds on here, and I, I try and bring on folks from every port of call. Um, it, it occurs to me that there's so many ways that people can help people to scale their own personal summits. And so that's number one. Uh, and then number two, I think if there's a common denominator to everybody, and all the really successful instructors. Um, information is one thing, you know, knowledge, certainly. You, you, you can't fake your way through it at the highest level. Mm -hmm. um, but every instructor who's successful has found a way to figure out what the learner's currency is. And they communicate in that currency. Um, David, Ledbetter, Butch, you know, all of them. It's... They, they will figure you out quickly, not just the problem, but they'll figure the learner out fast and understand how do I communicate with this individual to help them achieve what they're looking for? Because essentially that's what it's all about if it, at the end of the day. It's about communication. And you might have reams of information inside your head, but if you can't get it out in a quick, concise, understandable, um, cogent way, you know, you're just going to confuse the learner more. And so I'd say that those are the two things. And I guess they're kind of ethereal that as, as I talk back on them, but those are the things that have really stood out to me in all the conversations. I mean, I'll lis I, I listen to these guys as, as a fan. And if you ever listen to me, everyone says I'm a good interviewer, but I don't interview. I just talk to you as a fan. Mm -hmm. And I'm figuring that you're smarter than I am. And I'm going to try and get some of what you got. And so when someone starts, I say to them before, if I interview any one of you ever, before we go, I will say to you, this is about you. If you feel inspired to go somewhere, just go there. And I will follow you with comments or anecdotes or I'll lead you because I don't go in there with some agenda, really. Sometimes I have a topic in my head. But I just want to start to experience the individual's knowledge and then hear how they communicate. And as I think back on all the great interviews we've done, the communication has been crisp. It's been on point. Uh, and that to me is, is paramount to success for any instructor. Mm. No, fantastic. Um, I, I think we could talk for hours. I think we'll, we'll jump across. There's a couple of questions come in. Um, first one's from Stephen Moore. So Stephen, if you want to open up your mic, you can ask Mark individually. Hey, Mark, how's it going, man? 
Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Uh, very good. Very good. I love the podcast. Just say that before I ask this question. So thanks, thanks for bro. all you're doing on that front. Um, when you started the on course thing, and I'm sure you'd learned a ton in your early career, um, you know, through, through all you've done already about course management. But I imagine when you started the on course reporting, you started learning a lot more. Do you feel that you've learned more in the last couple of years through like strokes gained and decade systems that have kind of shone a light more mm -hmm. on the course management being more stats based and mathematics based now? Or do you feel that you learned more in your, you know, first couple of years? Um, you know, in the end, uh, good golfers don't accidentally stumble their way to success. All right. And if you watch any great golfer play, you'll probably see the manifestation of strokes gained. You'll see the manifestation of the decade system. And, and what I think Scott Fawcett has done is fantastic. Um, there's nothing like data to galvanize an argument. Because especially for us, when you're trying to make a point to someone and we're just some guy who's got a bit of a resume or some girl, forgive me, Leah, um, the, the, um, they're like, okay, it's another talking head. I'm paying this guy or girl money. But when you see the fact behind the thing, it, it lends some gravity to the situation. But when I, as an on-course guy, I'll tell you, um, the greats, they don't necessarily need stroke scale metrics to tell them how to play a hole. They have the sense, like Tiger Woods, I hope he is well, just, just has a sense. The guy has an intuitiveness that I don't think was, he was born with. I just think it's learned. You, you, you learn how to play the game and you learn the game on the golf course and you learn the game under pressure and you learn how your body performs. I'll tell you this much, you know, I, I, la I laugh because I'm on a podcast called The First Cut. And there are three guys, two of them are data analysts and the other one's a golf teaching professional. And they're lobbing strokes gain data at every description. Uh, as soon as a, yeah, he's going to win because he's leading strokes gain, whatever. I'm like, Pell, he's had nothing but, because I'm on the course. I'm like, he was putting downhill seven out of eight times over there on the greens that were so slick you couldn't stop a ball on them. Don't come and tell me he's putting badly. It's completely situational. So, so I, I, there's there, there's more to it than that sort of stuff. But that all being said, um, as a teacher, having that data and then using it, it, it helps to bring the point across. It's currency for people. You know, if if, if you say to me, I'm going to give you a million dollars, and you've got the million dollars sitting right next to you, and then the other person doesn't, who are you likely to believe? You'll go with the the fact, right? And so there's, there's a certain fact to it that's helpful, but in the end, I think learning to play the game and, and understanding situational analysis, and again, being broad about the approach to course management and really looking wide when you're practicing, I, I think is how that stuff is learned and how that stuff is owned. Because I can tell, a, I, I can tell a, a, a golfer, till the cows come home, hey, that front right bunker is not a bad spot. Six out of 10 guys have got it up and down from there. He can look at me and go, yeah, uh, when my rear end is about that tight and I'm not that confident with a love wedge in my hand right now, you can tell me all the data you want. I'm hitting the thing at the left side of the green over here. <laughs> so, so, so that's where it's helpful, but the, it's, you've got to understand the ebbs and the flows of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, ab absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate the reply. Right. Fantastic. And I think we've got a question, uh, Leah, why don't you uh, fire away with uh, your points? Excellent. Hi, thanks for taking the time, first of all, uh, to talk to all of us. Um, so I predominantly do deal with the smaller ones, but I am also a lead coach for our Surrey girls under 15s team and I've done that for a couple of years now. And I just want to get some advice on how you deal with parents and also in my case, we have what we call selectors who pick the girls for the team for our various match weeks about almost um, to how much you're coaching technically. I am very much like everybody in this group about the individual player, getting to know them, working out what, what best area to hit first. So yeah. uh, I guess if you're going to sum it up very hands off <laughs> and sort of uh, go, go down that road. But a lot of parents, when they hear the word Surrey or county coaching, 
come in with almost what technically are you working on to the point where they're obsessed and want you to overcoach the children? How do you deal when you have a parent or someone like that? <laughs> Honestly, Leah, I coach the parents more than I coach the kids. Um, I really, I, no jokes, I, I really do. When there's some parent along and it's an individual session, when, not when it's a group, I will be talking to the kid in their currency. Like I said, it, I, I will kneel down out of earshot from the, play, from the parents and talk to them and talk close to them so the parent can't really hear. And then I'll look for the response from the child that I've got this. And then they'll hit a decent shot or two. And then I'll go back to the parent and tell them, oh, we're doing this and this and that. And when you're watching, watch for this. So I'm essentially guiding them because every parent has got the Tiger Woods syndrome going on. You know, they, their kid is the next great golfer. <laughs> Here's one. I, I'm hoping my girl turns really good. But if she doesn't, I've got to be okay with it. So, so I, go to the, I go to the learner first and then I move back. And when the learner is hitting, I'll stand next to the parent some and go, it's doing this. Watch for this. And I start to empower them to say, you're very important in this equation. But I'm saying, stay in your lane over here. Don't start yeah. bringing me something you've read in a book. This is what's going on right now. And then I say, and then I say this is what they're working on. Look for this. So I, I give them action points. And so now they feel like they can be involved. And you're not, you know they're not going to go and run rampant after you've left and come yeah. up with something that they've heard from their buddy in the grill room. Because that, that is a bad, bad problem. So, so I, I, I try and split them as far as possible. Now, you get those parents that are sort of the helicopter parents a little. Um, I, I guess I'm just, I've got enough bravado to say them, just step back for a little while here. You know, if this was a PGA Tour event where you want your kid to play one day, the caddy will be going, go back up. You know, just give us a little room. Give the kid yeah. the mandate to be able to swing free, uh, kind of make a mistake or two, uh, and we'll go from there. Cool, excellent. I, I like that. So just involve them at arm's yeah. length and uh, explain as you're going along. Exactly. Um, I, exactly. I think sometimes in the position I am, I've got lots of people um, looking over my lesson plans and they they sometimes I feel like I've got the expectation it has to be really technical or they're expecting high things because it's county level. Um, so anything any advice on how to deal with that just from external forces like these selectors, other lead coaches I have to work with. I said, mm -hmm. I'm very hands off, particularly with these girls, because I see them maybe once a month and I'm not really their main coach either. So I'm yeah. trying to do like a balancing act of making the sessions, you know, um, as in depth as possible, but remembering they are under 15, they're, they're kids <laughs> at the same time. So don't, sorry, I'm taking out everyone's time if you can. Give no, some no, advice that's, about that because that's that's a very good Leah, that's a very good point. Um, and that's gotta be hard. I'll be honest with you, that that must be tough to navigate. What I would say then is look, put your lesson plan together and make it sound all verbose and jargon. But remember, you're the communicator in the end, you're the tip of the spear. And, and write what you want what they want to hear, and then sort of stick to that, but you don't have to follow this verbatim and say, well, today we were working on wrist alignments and whatever the case might be. Remember, at the end of the day, I hate to say this, you're the architect of these people's destiny. And yeah, you're going to get some forces from without and, and give them sometimes what they want to hear. The, the truth of it, here's the truth, okay? If that child is playing better, they're not going to care. Uh, they, they're not going to care what you've been teaching this individual. If the child's playing badly, then you've got to deal with the ramifications. So, so, so write what they want to hear. Don't, don't, don't be two-faced in that you're lying to them, but you can make it sound more flowery than what it really is. You, you, you get me? Because when, yeah. when I'm standing back talking to the parents, I'm telling them something completely different <laughs> to what the kid understood. It's the yeah. same thing, but the way I, the currency, the way I spoke to the child and the way I spoke to the parents, they were different. Uh, and, and that's cool. where the art of the communication comes in. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. That's your time up for the next three weeks, Leah. Um, you Sorry. Want to next three weeks. All right. um, Warren, we'll, we'll head over to you, mate.
Thanks, Gavin. Um, okay, um, I'll, I'll ask this question, but I'll, I'll explain the reason behind it. Um, um, I used to work with Simon Kahn on the European tour as his putting coach, and I also uh -huh. helped him understand about strategy, um, and especially when we went to Jamira, because um, the way the the way the greens worked. And the question I want to ask you, if my phone allows me, is I learned a lot of lessons working with him. So my question to you is, what has been the biggest lesson that you have learned? Working with professional golfers? Well, just any, just anyone. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> what is the biggest lesson that you feel that you've learned in your whole career? There have been a number, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm quick to respond to my initial thought, my reaction. And I had an interaction with Jim Furyk and his father, Mike, at the Tour Championship a few years ago. And um, uh, Jim was playing with a practice round with a client of mine that was playing in the Tour Championship. And they were playing the uphill par five. I can't remember what hole it is. And they both had tee shots down there. And I'm standing looking at Jim's bag. And every club is normal there. And then the eight iron had two strips of weight across the back of it, just two, just the one club. And I couldn't help myself. I walk off the tee and I'm like, Jim, what gives over you? And he, he picked the eight iron up and he sort of waggled it around like this. And he goes, it just felt different to the rest. And I'm like, are you serious? I mean, two strips of weight not feel, have you, are you that in tune with what you're feeling? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, now I feel like it just matches up better. So I'm like, cool. So then his dad is traipsing behind. His dad's been his only coach his entire life. And I go to, I drop back and I said to him, Mike, I just want to say to you after this interaction I've just had that I have so much respect for you and I want to congratulate you on all the success. And how on earth did you make it through Jim's entire career without changing his golf swing? Because I'm sure the blowback you were getting was off the charts. And he said to me, he goes, Mark, it was easy. He goes, all we're working on doing is making sure that on the 16th hole at the US Open, if Jim's got a six iron in his hand and he's trying to hit a draw, that thing's going to draw and it's not going to fade. He goes, I don't care what it looks like. They're more worried about what, it, they, about what it looks like, not us. What Jim's worried about is that when I stand over the shot and the pressure is rampant and I've got to deliver, this is what I have to do. And I looked at this and I'm like, that sounded so simple but it sounded like the sweet Lord Jesus descended from heaven and punched me in the face with it. And since then I have not deviated from that is that we do something with a view to performing under pressure. Case closed. If you've got issues with it, Lee, I guess this gets back to you. If you've got issues with us, they're your issues. They're not his issues. So Warren, that's probably, you know, the lesson that stands out right now. That's great. That's great. Thank you ever so much. You're welcome. Um, let's uh, let's head over to uh, to Ben in in um, sunny Wales. <laughs> yeah, not so sunny over here, Gavin. Unfortunately, my friend. Oh. Where are you, Ben? I can't. Uh, there you are. Hello. Hey, how are we doing? Um, Mark, thanks Good for your you. time. Um, there's something I picked up on. Uh, I, I listen to a lot of coaches, and I, I've got probably an A4 page of notes here. So I really appreciate your time. Um, my question is, you're the only person that I've, I've heard say anything to do with spirituality within your coaching with your college yeah. students. Um, my question is, do you ever work on uh, any form of meditation or uh, kind of out of body experiences with your players to help them with their pre-shot routine or process? Um. Out of body experiences, and no, I'm, I'm I'm not that ethereal. Um, I certainly do spend time on meditation, and it takes a form of whatever your your faith is. Um, I don't try to impose my faith on them, um, but what I do, I, I do focus on a lot is breathing. I focus a lot on becoming internal enough that you're actually aware of how your body systems are going, because. Under pressure, and when things start going wrong, and you know as an instructor that this is likely, you're going to get this seven and a half, eight, nine times out of 10 around, that panic typically sets in. 
And the one thing I know for certain, and this will probably be on my gravestone somewhere, is that stress and tension have been the biggest wrecker of a golf swing in the history of mankind. And so if you can find a way to be internal enough and aware enough of how your system is performing, kind of like the dials on your car, then you can get yourself to a place where maybe you reduce the overheating, you reduce the revs in the engine, so that the stuff you've worked on on the range with Ben can now magnify. Because, you know, when panic sets in, it's disastrous. You know this. Yep. And so I spend a lot of time with folks, you know, working on meditating, being present, working on breathing, being aware. And then when the stuff is hitting the fan, not going outward as much as what most folks do, go inward first, you know, get the system settled down and then sort through the challenges that are at hand because they're coming thick and fast. You know this. And if I'm all harried and my breathing is shallow and stuff, I'm adding fuel to this raging fire already. And then people wonder why my lesson plan, Leah, wasn't working. <laughs> okay. So um, I, it's, yes, I do spend time on that. And I try and impress upon folks the value of it. But here's the difficult part. It's no guarantee for success. It's, I, I, I talk about direct and inf indirect influences on a golf ball. And you can talk to me about how your hips move all day long. And I'm going to say that's not a direct influence on the golf shot. The club face is. So if you can start to convince me that your hip action is connected to the club face and this is going to change, by all means, go where you're going. The problem with working on meditation, all these sorts of things, it sounds cool. And it sounds sexy as ripped to the individual the first time. But if they're doing this and it's not working, then they'll ditch this for some wrist alignment adjustment because they saw it on YouTube. So this, that's the hard part of teaching this to say to them, stick to the process because the gains you're going to find are going to be incremental. And at the end of the day, you'll look back and go, holy cow, you know what? Over all this time, I've now can see how I've changed as an individual because it's not going to be like a click of the fingers and something is different. So there, therein lies the challenge. But yes, to your question, I do. Breathing, inward awareness, the ability to neutralize the system, get to stop the car from redlining, basically. Nice. That was, yeah, stunning answer. Honestly, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. Perfect. Um, before we head over to uh, Spartacus for the finale, um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you what you did the night that Trevor won the Masters and, and how much credit you're taking for that. Um, the night before Trevor won the Masters, we were all in the same house together and he disappeared for a long phone call. I didn't know who it was and he came out and he was kind of a little pale, as you could imagine. You know, night before the Masters, leading by two, led the entire tournament. And he was very quiet and I eventually plucked up the courage to say to him, is everything okay? Who was that? He goes, yeah, that's fine. That was Gary, Mr. Player. I'm like, oh. And then in the silence for a bit, I think, and I'm like, well, what do you say? And Trevor sort of looked at me quizzically and he said to me, he goes, something to the effect of that you've played great. Trevor was leading for three days straight. Had shot 68, 68, 69, 68, 69, I think it was conditions were hard yeah, driven the thing great iron control was awesome distance control was on point putted nicely and gary said to me that tomorrow is going to be hard work and he said you're going to have a lot of adversity and he said you've got to be a big boy tomorrow he's like because it's it's been plain sailing it's not going to be plain sailing and for a golfer who's basically hasn't put a foot wrong for three days that's probably tough to hear and the night before the end of a uh, night before a final round of a major, you want someone saying to you how great you are. Where Gary was like, listen, big boy, it's going to be hard tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, funnily enough, who knew? Hall of Famer. It, what Gary said it was prophesied. I mean, Trevor started off, the start was rough. He bogeyed the first. It was an eagle made on the second. Uh, Trevor made an unreal up and down on four. 
and then sort of established himself, built a bit of a lead. And then Tiger started making a run. And Tiger hold like a 40 footer for birdie on 13. And Trevor was in trouble down 11 and made like a 20 footer from off the green for par. And that sort of settled things. And he hits it straight over the back of the green in the bushes there behind 12. And actually hold like a five footer for a bogey. And so there was this move forward, fall back, move forward, fall back thing the whole day long. Then he hit a beautiful wedge birdie 13, pard 14, hit on the green on 15, thank God. Um, so now he had a three stroke lead and lo and behold, he hits it straight in the water on 16 <laughs> and uh, makes double there and then walks off the green in the, cr in the crowd with the patrons were still applaud applauding. And so he's got a lead, gets it up and down out the greenside bunker on um, 17 after the ball just stood up against the breeze and fell down short. And now he's holding it, I think a two stroke lead, no, three stroke lead going up 18 now. Drives it straight down the middle of 18, probably the best drive I've seen him hit ever. And apparently he said to me afterwards, he goes, I got there and the ball was like halfway down in a divot in the middle of the fairway. And so he has Gary saying to him, listen, buddy, it's going to be hard and you're going to be a big boy. And Gary was right. And, and, and I will say to you that you must say to all your clients, prepare them. Pre like when you get into the ring as a boxer, you might heavily outman the other individual. That other individual is going to land a punch or two and you've got to be ready for it. And that's what all great tournament golfers, I believe, do. And, and heck, if Gary says it, nine majors hall of fame i believe it yeah fascinating fascinating story and it was tough that the weather was awful that sunday wasn't it god no those oh, trees i mean those trees were blowing sideways i got to the golf course and i was like lord almighty are you serious <laughs> trevor shot 75 and increased his lead by one that's how hard yeah. it was playing yeah right well uh roger over to you pal um for our final question stand by mark stand by all right. Yeah, hi, Mark. It's Roger here. Um, I'm going back many years when my, my cousin, Rod Stewart, uh, lookalike, uh, was on the tour for 30 <laughs> years. And do you remember him? Brilliant. He, um, many, many times, he carried for Boxall and Torrance. Oh, and all yes, there. yes, I and remember him. A real I character. Oh, yeah. But he... Um, he, 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 many times we're on the practice ground on a maybe a Wednesday night or Thursday morning, and um, they got this inner spiritual feeling that this player was going to win this week, and yet he's not on form. And you talked about the spiritual side and the holistic side, and that anything could happen, anything could be so fickle to make them just all of a sudden think, I can play well, I'm going to play well this week. And many, many times he gave me an inside tip and said, take this player. Yeah, but he's not been winning for ages. He'll win this week. Is is in the is in the best. Is in harmony. Is in in you know, inner peace. And the other guy, I've got my money on or thinking about. Is what he's told me to forget him. His wife just left him. His, his house is being reconfigured. <laughs> That's inside of trading, isn't it? <laughs> once once you get something wrong, that little thing in your head, you know, you 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 zip on your trousers split on the first tee or something. That mm -hmm. could set you off for that mo for that first nine. You know. And it's, do, you, do you find that's the case? You can walk on a practice range sometimes and there's a player you think, wow, his chest is out. He's got the pole to chest. He's going to win this. So he's going to do well this week. What do you think? Yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt, Roger. Um, you know, they might not win. You know, back then when I was a young teacher on the European tour and, uh, and your buddy was around, the, lev the, lev the depth of talent with respect to everyone wasn't as great as what it is now. No. Uh, and you could probably throw a blanket over, you know, the 15, 20 guys or so that, was, that were likely to win. You would get the odd outlier. Nowadays on all tours, anyone at any time could win. So, and you could see it in the gate, in the comportment. You can watch the interactions with the caddies. You can see the in interactions with the instructors. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, you get sense for players. And, and to me, too, there's something about a player who's swinging well, where it looks uninterrupted, you know, from the top of the backswing through the finish. There's a free pass of the club head. And, and there's no laboring. And, and, and you just get a sense that this individual, it's there. And it just has to be there for a week nowadays. And that's what everyone's sort of looking for. Um, I mean, my brother's career was changed on... Uh, with one week of his life 
you know, yeah. one around yeah. the world, but one week changes him. He's, he's viewed in a different level. And he showed up at that event putting hard, horribly. He had three yeah. putters in the bag on Monday morning when we went to the putting green. And next thing yeah. on the hardest greens on the PGA Tour, he wins. See, so it's it's sort of what golf represents. And to your point, I think the lesson behind that is we need to embrace its mercurial nature and embrace yeah. the variability of it. And as instructors, continually communicate with folks that you have to be prepared for this sort of stuff. And yeah. then you can't be lazy because when you do suddenly find your purple patch, it will probably be a little fleeting. You've got to make some hay. And then when things aren't there, you've got to now play a little more savvy. Um, I'll leave you with this. It was a wonderful lesson, Ray Floyd. I mean, to me, he was probably the greatest, the greatest competitor with respect anytime, anywhere. Because when Floyd found he was going to find a way to beat you. And he went to Barbara Teller one time and said, Dr. Bob, you got to help my boy, Robert, who was a really good college player, turned pro, and Robert was struggling. And he said, I can't understand my kid. He goes, when he's two under par after four, he starts playing defensively. But when he's two over par after four, he starts playing aggressively. And he starts attacking some pins that he shouldn't have. And next thing, two over par is now four over par after nine or whatever it is. And now he's too far behind the eight ball. So it, it sort of spoke to Floyd's mindset that when yeah. the iron is hot, I'm striking. And when the iron's not so hot, I'm surviving because I know there'll be this time and I've just got to keep myself around for that week when you get yep. that sense that, or that, that stretch of holes, whatever it might be, because you can see folks, they move throughout the round. I mean, that's the beauty yep. of PGA Tour Live, I'll be honest with you. You see these players for an entire round from shot one through the end of the round and you watch stuff up and stuff down and there's variations all of the time and they're just playing as such and they're sort of surviving and thriving and and so there is a real human spiritual element to me, to, to your observation. Well, the Ray Floyd uh, analogy was great. I've got his book, The Element of Scoring. It's a tiny little paper book, paperback. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. As I say, he, was, he wasn't, uh, didn't have the best technique, but as you say, he knew how to get around that course. That's why I got the book. It was fantastic. Yeah, that, anyway. that, uh, that, that enduring image of when he held the bunker shot at Shinnecock, when he pointed at the hole like this, for me, that'll live in, the oh, in my head for as long yeah. as I breathe. Absolutely, yeah. Well, uh, uh, Trevor in um, Oosterhausen used to practice at McDonald's Portal where I used to work. And it okay. was great watching them many, many times. You know, £10 on a bunker shot 100 times. It was marvellous. And uh, there, there's one who's got a great swing, Louis. He pauses at the top, doesn't he? Oh, uh, yeah, no, it's... it's you know, you get certain golf swings that look like they fell straight out of heaven, and his is one of those. Um, yeah. Uh, it just, I mean, it's just so, so easy and so graceful and so uninterrupted, but it's its emblematic of what's happening inside of his head, really, too. That's kind of the yeah. guy he is. Thank you. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Roger, as always, great questions. And Mark, on behalf of, of those at Golf Zone, Ledbetter and, and Gavin and I, and more importantly, all of the guys and girls that are on the, the call today that have taken time out of their day, uh, we really appreciate you, appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend an hour with us. What an hour it was. Uh, so we'd like to thank you immensely for the time that you've had uh, with us it's today. My pleasure. I mean, yeah, uh, it's, it's so good to be with you guys. It, it's so good to sort of meet all of you guys. Um, please feel free to reach out. I'd, you know, whatever little nuggets I can share, I'd, I'd love to. Hopefully we'll feature you guys all on my show one day and, and we'll expose your bright minds to the rest of the world. Yeah, fantastic. Guys, when you registered for this session, Gavin and I said that we would have a little surprise for you. Um, we're currently in the midst of transferring our Ledbetter University platform to a new platform. And once we are live with that in a week, week and a half's time, we'll be giving all of you access to one of our courses uh, free of charge. Uh, that will be David's Secrets of the Swing course that he put together, uh, talking about his philosophy and his evolution over the past few years. Um, so look out for that. Gavin and I, hopefully next week in our session, we'll be bringing to life the new platform. Uh, we're currently working hard on transferring the content across and it will be a great platform for all of you to use because it's going to have a Facebook element to it where you can have 
your own little groups in terms of kind of a lead better kids group, a lead better group as a whole for all instructors. And you can share things, you can actually post comments, you can interact hopefully with the authors of some of the courses that we have. And then obviously Gavin and I will be populating a lot of content on there. So we'll have the education side of things, the certification side of things housed there, but we'll also have a great community network and that's obviously what we're all about. We're trying to create a really healthy environment where anybody can feel free to ask questions, share their thoughts. And as we say, you know, David's mantra, those who dare to teach must never cease to learn. So look out from Gavin and I to uh, let you know a little bit more about that. And Mark, once again, thank you. Gavin, thanks very much as always. And we'll be back next week. So thank you, everybody.